Thank you very much, Tim, for that really warm introduction. Uh, I think you may have set the bar a, a little high, but I, I feel incredibly privileged to have the job that I have. I, I grew up in country New South Wales and left school in 1979 and, as Tim said, went straight to the Reserve Bank. And it's been, I've been there many years and I feel incredibly privileged now to, to have the job that I have. I'm also privileged that so many people have turned out today to, to hear me speak here in Brisbane and I'd really like to welcome the school students at the, at the back of the room. It's great to see the interest of young people in economics. So thank you for the invitation and um, it, it's great to be here. This afternoon I'd like to talk about household debt and housing prices. This is a familiar topic and it's attracted a lot of attention over recent times. I think it's easy to understand why that's so. The cost of housing and how it's financed matters to us all. We all need to live somewhere, and for many people, their home is their largest single asset. Real estate's also the main form of collateral for bank lending, and the levels of debt and housing prices affect the resilience of our economy to various shocks. But beyond these economic effects, high levels of debt and high housing prices have broader effects on the communities in which we live. The high cost of housing is a real issue for many Australians and it can have serious side effects on our communities. High levels of debt and high housing costs can also reinforce the existing distribution of wealth within our society, making both social and geographic mobility more difficult. So it's readily understandable why Australians are so interested in these issues. At the Reserve Bank too, we've been focused on these issues for some time, particularly in the context of our monetary and financial stability responsibilities. Our work's really been in three broad areas. First, understanding the aggregate trends. Second, understanding the distribution of debt across the community. And third, understanding how the level of debt and housing prices affect the way the economy operates and its resilience to future shocks. So this afternoon, I'd like to talk a little about uh, the work that we've done in each of these three areas. So this first chart provides a, a pretty good summary of the aggregate picture. It shows the ratio of nation, nationwide housing prices and household debt to household income. As you can see, housing prices and debt both rose a lot from the mid-1990s to the early 2000s. The ratios then moved sideways for the better part of a decade. As you can see, in some years they were up and some years they were down, but, but basically for a decade they moved sideways. But then, just in the past few years, these ratios have been rising again, and today they're both at record highs. I think it's worth pointing out, though, that while the debt-to-income ratio has increased, the ratio of debt to the value of the housing stock uh, has not risen. This reflects the large increase in housing prices and the fact that we've been building more homes. Over recent times, there's also been a substantial increase in the value of the household sector's financial assets. You can see that in the um, third line in that chart. You can also see in the top line that the ratio of net wealth to income has, has risen substantially and it too is at a record high. So both the value of our assets and the value of our liabilities relative to our income have increased in recent years and we need to understand the implications of that for the way the economy operates. I'd like though to turn to why the ratios of housing prices and debt to income have risen over time. A central factor is that financial liberalisation and the low interest rates that followed the return to low inflation in the 1990s increased people's ability to borrow. These developments meant that Australians could take out larger and more flexible loans and by and large, as a society, we took advantage of this new ability as we sought to buy the house that, or housing that we really wanted. We could, of course, have decided to use the benefits of lower nominal interest rates and financial liberalisation for other purposes. But instead, we chose to borrow more for housing, and this pushed up the average price of housing given the constraints on the supply side. The supply of well-located housing and land in our cities has been constrained by a combination of zoning issues, geography, and inadequate transport. Another related factor has been the fact that our population has been growing at a reasonable pace. 
And adding to the picture, Australians consume more land per dwelling than is possible in most other countries, although this is starting to change. And many of us have chosen to live in a few large coastal cities. So increased ability to borrow, more demand, and constrained supply means higher housing prices. So we saw a marked increase in these ratios up until the early 2000s. At the time, there was quite a lot of discussion about whether these higher ratios were sustainable. But as things have turned out, the higher ratios have been sustained for quite a while now. In my view, this largely reflects the choices that we've made as a society regarding how and where we live, urban planning and transport, and the nature of our financial systems. It's these choices that have underpinned the high level of housing prices in Australia. So the changes that we've seen in these ratios are largely structural. Recently, though, the ratios of housing prices and debt to income have been increasing again. Lower interest rates, both in real and nominal terms, this time largely reflecting international factors, have again played some role. But there are some other important factors that are also at work. One of these is the slow growth in household income. As you can see here, during the 2000s, aggregate household income increased at an average rate of about 7% a year. In contrast, over the past four years, average growth in incomes has been less than half of the earlier outcome. It's averaged around 3%. So slower growth in incomes will push up the debt to income ratio unless growth in debt also slows. And this, this slowing in debt has not occurred and this partly explains why these ratios have been moving up again over recent years. A second factor is that some of our cities have become true global cities. And reflecting this, in some of our markets, there's been very strong demand by overseas investors, and in some markets, that has pushed up prices as well. A third factor has been stronger population growth. As you can see here, population growth picked up during the mining investment boom, and although it's subsequently fallen back a bit, it's still around half a percentage point faster than it was before the mining boom. For some time, the rate of home building did not respond to the faster population growth. Indeed, the response took the better part of a decade. Population growth picked up, but the rate of home building did not. Fortunately, in the last few years, the rate of home building has picked up, and we're currently adding to the housing stock at a rate that we haven't seen in more than two decades, and over time, this will make a difference. It's Melbourne and Sydney where population growth has been the fastest. Not surprising, it's these two cities where the price gains have been the largest and these price gains have helped induce more supply. I think this is obvious from this next chart. It's Victoria and New South Wales that account for all of the recent upward movement in the ratio of national house prices to income. As you can see here, in each of the other states, the ratio of housing prices to income is below the previous peaks. So there's not a single story that fits right across the country. This is despite us having a common monetary policy and a common interest rate for the country as a whole. So factors other than the level of interest rates are also clearly at work. In summary then, the supply demand dynamics have been pushing up aggregate housing prices in our larger cities relative to our incomes. With interest rates as low as they've been and prices rising, Many people have found it attractive to borrow, to invest in an asset whose price is appreciating. And the result has been very strong growth in borrowing by investors, which has been with investors accounting for 30 to 40 per cent of, of new housing loans. This borrowing is not the underlying cause of the higher housing prices, but the borrowing has added to the upward pressure on prices caused by the underlying supply demand dynamics. In a sense, it's acted as a financial amplifier, particularly in some of our cities, adding to the already upward pressure on housing prices. The borrowing by investors is also obviously contributing to the rise in the aggregate debt to income ratio. So just like in the early 2000s, there is once again a discussion of whether these increases in housing prices and debt will continue and whether they're sustainable. I want to return to this issue um, later on in my remarks. Before I do, though, I want to briefly discuss our work on the distribution of debt across the household sector. 
This is really important because it's not the aggregate or the average household that gets into trouble. So at the Reserve Bank, we've devoted considerable resources to try and to, to understand the distribution of debt across the community. And one important source of information here is the household level survey um, undertaken, or the, the, the HILDA survey, the Household Income and Labor Dynamics Survey. If we look at the income distribution, it's clear that the rise in the debt to income ratio has been most pronounced for higher income households. You can see that in the top two lines in this chart. This is different to what occurred in the United States in the run up to the financial crisis with the uh, the, all the subprime lending, when in the US it was lower income households that borrowed a lot of money. That's much less the case in Australia. It's also possible to look at how the debt to income ratio has changed across the age distribution. As you can see in this next chart, the ratio has risen for households of all ages, except the very youngest who tend to have quite low levels of debt. Borrowers of all ages have taken out larger mortgages relative to their incomes and they're taking longer to pay them off. Older households are more likely than before to have an investment property with a mortgage and it's become common for people to have a mortgage at the time of retirement. We also look at the share of households with a debt to income ratio above a specific threshold and the, this work is uh, summarised in this chart. As you can see, in 2012, around sorry, in 2002, around 12% of households had debt that was over three times their income. By 2014, this figure had increased to 20% of households. And there's also been an increase, although not as pronounced, in the share of households with even higher debt-to-income ratios. Another data set that provides insight into the distributional issues is one maintained by the Reserve Bank on loans that have been securitised. This data set indicates that around two-thirds of housing borrowers are at least one month ahead of their scheduled repayments and half of borrowers are six months or more ahead. That's the good news. But as you can see, there's also a substantial number of borrowers that only have small buffers if things go wrong. At the aggregate level, though, nationwide indicators of household financial stress remain pretty contained. That's not surprising, given that Many borrowers are materially ahead of their mortgage repayments. Interest rates are low, and the unemployment rate's been steady for quite a while now. At the same time, though, the household-level data do show that there's been a fairly broad-based increase in indebtedness across our population, and the number of highly indebted households has also increased. So I'd now I'd like to turn to the third element of our work, the implications of all this for the way the economy operates and its resilience to future shocks. It's commonplace to say that housing prices and debt levels matter because of financial stability issues. When people say this, what they typically have in mind is that a severe correction in the property market, when balance sheets are highly leveraged, could cause instability in the banking system, and obviously that would damage the economy. So the traditional financial stability concern is that the banks get into trouble, and this causes trouble for the overall economy. This is not what lies behind the Reserve Bank's recent focus on household debt and housing prices in Australia. The banks are resilient and they're soundly capitalised. A significant correction in the property market would no doubt put a dent in their profitability. But the stress tests that have been done under APRA's eye confirm that the banks are resilient to large movements in the prices of residential property. Instead, the issue that we have focused on is the possibility of future sharp cuts in household spending because of stretched balance sheets. Given the high levels of debt and high housing prices, it's likely that some households would respond to a future shock to income or housing prices by deciding that they'd simply borrowed too much. This could then prompt a sharp contraction in spending as people try to get their balance sheets back into better shape. An otherwise manageable downturn could then be turned into something more serious. So the financial stability question we're focused on is to what extent does the higher level of household debt make us less resilient to future shocks? Answering this question with precision is difficult. It's largely a matter of judgment. History doesn't provide us with a particularly good guide given that housing prices and debt levels are at levels that we haven't seen before 
and the distribution of debt across the population is also changing. Given this, one of the research priorities of the Reserve Bank at the moment has been to use individual household level data to understand how the level of indebtedness affects household spending. The results indicate that the higher is indebtedness, the greater is the sensitivity of spending to shocks to income. This is regardless of whether we measure indebtedness as the debt to income ratio or the share of income spent servicing that debt. If these results were to translate to the aggregate level, it would mean that the higher levels of debt increase the sensitivity of future consumer spending to various shocks. The higher levels of debt also appear to have affected how higher household, uh, sorry, higher housing prices influence household spending. For some years, households used increasing equity in their homes to finance spending and consumption grew very strongly. Today, the reaction seems quite different. This is evident in the estimates of housing equity withdrawal. You can see this, the change in this graph. In the earlier periods from the mid uh, 1990s to the mid 2000s when housing prices were rising the household sector withdrew equity from their housing to finance consumption. Today households are much less inclined to do this and they're injecting not withdrawing equity from their housing investments. Many of us feel that we have enough debt and we don't want to increase current consumption using borrowed money. Many of us also worry about the impact of higher housing prices on the future cost of housing for our children. Like many parents, this concerns me. As I've spoken about previously, higher housing prices are really a two-edged sword. They deliver capital gains to the current owners, but they do increase the cost of future housing services, importantly, including for our children. This change in attitude is also affecting how spending responds to lower interest rates. With less appetite to incur more debt for current consumption, this part of the monetary transmission mechanism looks to be a little weaker than it once was. There is, however, probably an asymmetry here. When the interest rate cycle turns and interest rates start to rise, the higher debt levels are likely to make spending more responsive to interest rates than was the case in the past, and this is something that we will need to take a close account of at the Reserve Bank. In terms of resilience, though, my overall assessment is that the recent increases in household debt relative to income has made the economy less resilient to future shocks. Given this assessment, the Reserve Bank has strongly supported the prudential measures undertaken by APRA recently. Double-digit growth in debt owed by investors at a time of weak income growth cannot be strengthening the resilience of our economy, and nor can a very high concentration of interest-only loans. I want to point out, though, that APRA's measures are not targeted at high housing prices. The international evidence is that these types of measures cannot sustainably address pressures on housing prices originating from the underlying supply-demand dynamics. But the evidence is that they can provide breathing space while the underlying issues are addressed. In doing so, they can help lessen the financial amplification of the cycle that I spoke about before. Reducing this amplification while a better balance is established between supply and demand in the housing market can help build the resilience of our economy. And there are a number of reasons to expect that a better balance between supply and demand will be established over time. One of these is the increased rate of home building. As we're seeing here in Brisbane and also in some parts of Melbourne, increased supply does affect prices. The increase in supply is also affecting rents, which in a number of markets are increasing very slowly, and in some markets they're declining. A second reason is the increased investment in some cities, including in Sydney, in transport. Over time, this will increase the supply of well-located land, and this will help as well. And a third reason is that at some point, interest rates in Australia will increase. To be clear, this is not a signal about the near-term outlook for interest rates in Australia. But it is a reminder that over time, we could expect interest rates to rise, not least because of global developments. Over recent years, the low interest rates in Australia have helped the economy adjust to the winding down of the mining investment boom. They've also helped support employment and demand through a quite significant adjustment in the domestic economy. We should not, though, expect interest rates to always remain this low.
It remains to be seen how these various influences on housing prices will play out. Other policies, including tax and zoning policies, also have an effect. But increased supply and better transport could be expected to help address the ongoing rises in housing prices relative to our income. These changes and some normalisation of interest rates over time might also reduce the incentive to borrow to invest in an asset whose price always seems to be going up. To the extent that over time a better balance is established between supply and demand, we'll be better off not incurring too much debt and having housing prices go too high while this adjustment is occurring. I want to make it clear though that the Reserve Bank does not have a target for the debt to income ratio or the ratio of nationwide housing prices to income. As I spoke about earlier, there are good reasons why these ratios move over time. My judgement though is that in the current environment, the resilience of our economy would be enhanced by an extended period in which housing prices and debt outstanding increase no faster than our incomes. Again, this is not a target or a policy objective of the Reserve Bank, but rather a general point about how we build resilience. Many of you will be aware that these issues have figured in deliberations at the Reserve Bank Board for some time now. This is entirely consistent with our flexible medium-term inflation targeting framework. With a medium-term target, it's appropriate that we pay attention to the resilience of the economy to future shocks. In the current environment of low income growth, faster growth in household debt is unlikely to help that resilience. We've also been watching the labour market very carefully. The unemployment has moved up a little bit over recent months and wage growth continues to be quite subdued. Encouragingly, employment growth has been a bit stronger just recently and the forward-looking indicators suggest ongoing growth in employment. And we want to see a continuation of these trends before we can be confident that the economy is picking up as we expect. Stronger growth in incomes would also, of course, help people deal with the high levels of debt and the high housing prices. Overall, our latest forecast is for economic growth to pick up gradually over the next couple of years and average around 3%. To conclude, I hope that these remarks help provide some insight into the Reserve Bank's thinking about housing prices and household debt. As balance sheets in the household sector have changed, so too is the way the economy works. Both from an individual perspective and from an economy-wide perspective, we need to, pay, need to pay close attention to how the higher level of household debt affects our resilience to future shocks. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. The governor has agreed to take some questions. Uh, I'll lead off with a few of my own, uh, but I expect that while the governor was speaking, you've come up with a few questions of your own and we're keen to hear them. Uh, if you wish to pose a question to the governor, I'd ask that you raise your hand uh, and we will get one of the young economists, people walking around with mics, to come to you. Uh, I'd ask that you wait until you have a, a microphone to ask your question so that the rest of the room can benefit from what you have to say. When asking a question, uh, I'd invite you to state your name and organization if applicable. Um, again, thank you for, for a thought-provoking address. Uh, in a speech you delivered in Melbourne on 4 April, and again re reiterated here today, you noted that from 2000, the supply of housing in Australia was not keeping pace with demand. And um, you noted that the, the supply deficit was compounded by insufficient investment in transport infrastructure. Now, what might be done to increase investment in transport infrastructure? And for example, do you believe that the federal government should be providing loans to help kickstart infrastructure projects, the cost of which might later be recovered through value capture? There are a lot of issues there. The, the, a point that I have made repeatedly is that the high housing prices really come from high land prices. And we can't do very much about that, but supply and demand does work. If you can increase the supply of well-located land, then the average price of residential land that goes into each, housing, each house dwelling will be less. So how do you increase the supply of well-located land? There are two things you can do. It's kind of the location of jobs and transport. Nothing makes kind of located land by being accessible to other parts of the city or the, wherever you live. So I think the best housing policy is really a transport policy. Uh, how, how, how do we get the extra investment in transport? That's kind of the, 
kind of a related question to what you're asking. And the governments can play an important role here. And you're seeing this in New South Wales with the governments, with the government building both road and rail, and it's making a difference. And I think over time it will help. Um, how the government finances that, you know, it's a it's a matter matter for them. But there is there is the possibility of greater investment in public in public and private transport actually helping on housing housing price. And I think it's it's important. It's probably the single best thing we can do. The supply deficit that you referred to is, is in the process of being corrected. As one of my graphs showed, the rate of home building now is the highest rate in decades. And that's going to make a difference. So how, how to finance the investment in transport, you know, it's, a, it's a good question. But you know, I think in the end we'll be better off if we can find a way of doing that. Um, look, in my introduction, I referred to your work uh, at the Bank of International Settlements, specifically that with Claudio Borio and the relationship between uh, low interest rates, market, uh, market stability, and higher asset values. Um, you, you drew on some of the macro prudential measures being used today, but I would say, for how long is it sustainable to keep interest rates very low and rely on these measures to temper asset values? Current measures are not designed to temper asset values. They're designed to build resilience in the system and I think that can help provide some breathing space because, the, because of the adjustments on the supply side and some of the other things I'm talking about, the, I think we, we can look forward to a better balance in supply and demand in the housing market over the next few years. And so these, the various measures that are being undertaken by APRA will help give us a bit of breathing space while that better balance is established. They're not designed, as I said, to address the high level of housing prices. Now, we have low interest rates in Australia for, for basically two reasons. One is global development. So we, we live in an interconnected world. World real interest rates are low. We have low interest rates in Australia as well. So there's nothing we can do really about that. Uh, the second reason we have low interest rates is that we're coming off the, the, the biggest mining investment boom in a, more than a century. In a way, it's kind of remarkable we've been manage, managed to digest the downside of that boom while still growing at kind of an average rate of 2.5%, and the low interest rates have actually helped that. So we've, we've got low interest rates because of um, the, the unwinding of the mining investment boom and the global situation, and I think that's been, been appropriate. If Just imagine kind of a world in which interest rates were, let's say, at 35 not 1.5%. The exchange rate would be higher, There'd be fewer jobs in, you know, in, tr in um, tourism, in education, in parts of manufacturing that are doing better now. Wage growth would be weaker, inflation would be even lower, unemployment would be higher. So I think we've needed these lower interest rates. But the, the it, financial stability considerations are a, a relevant issue here because, you know, in some central banks at the moment faced with the configuration that we've been facing would actually have had lower interest rates than we've got. Because inflation's a bit low, the unemployment rate's a bit high. So the standard kind of inflation targeting regime would probably lead you to have lower interest rates than we have. And I've said this publicly a few times, some of my own staff argue that kind of um, continuously. My sense is, though, that the, with interest rates as, as low as they are and the, the providing significant support to the economy, that lower interest rates at the moment, would risk um, increasing the imbalances in the system. That's not to say that we couldn't increase, uh, in, uh, reduce interest rates if we thought it was appropriate, but for, at the moment we haven't. So there's kind of, for the financial stability issues do affect the setting of interest rates, but not kind of in any mechanical way. Mm. I hope that's helpful. No, that is helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, look, I, I have more questions, but I'd like to see if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question. Uh, so if you do have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, one moment. Uh, Mike coming up from back here. Can you put your hand back up again? Thank you. Uh, Gavin, hello. Tony Dennis from Morgan's Financial. Um, you mentioned in your, your speech about the, the difference between uh, 
uh, Sydney, Melbourne and, and the rest of Australia in, in terms of uh, housing prices, etc. How does the RBA look at that dichotomy and um, when do you decide? You, you say that can help to smooth out. I, I guess it's smoothed out on the bottom, as you've just mentioned, but in terms of smoothing out, you know, maybe those bubbles on the top. How, how do you decide... Uh, between you know, those centres of the Australian universe and, and the vast rump of Australia, uh, what you should be doing with, with, with your policy? Well, the, our policy is really, decisions really guided by the framework, our flexible inflation targeting framework, trying to deliver you an average rate of inflation for the country as a whole of two point something over the next seven years, which is the term of my governorship. You know. So that, that's our basically framework, and we try and do that in a way that preserves economic stability and this is why these financial stability issues that I've talked about are, are a relevant consideration. We cannot smooth out housing price fluctuations nationally or even in particular markets. The way we, we, we take them into account, we try and understand what's going on, understand the dynamics here in the Brisbane apartment market. I mean, we spend time doing that and that all kind of together kind of makes the kind of the overall picture that we're trying to respond to. But the decisions are really taken within this well-established framework of a flexible, medium-term inflation targeting setup, um, with, a, with a strong emphasis on preserving economic and financial stability at the same time. And we make judgments. Not everyone agrees with the judgments, but we, 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 we sit down every month and we make those judgments. Right. Harry. Uh, Harriet Smith, I'm from QUT and also on the Economic Society Committee. Um, as a young person with a large superannuation but no assets, what kind of effect do you, have, do you think that will have on markets if they were to implement that, that idea that we can use our superannuation to put into our first home um, instead of the first home buyer's grant, for example? Well, it's highly politically contested at the moment. But, <laughs> but I think I can make an analytical argument which probably answers your question. You don't address housing affordability by adding to demand. <laughs> you address it by adding to supply. It's the supply of dwellings and the supply of well-located land. That's where the focus needs to be. I think policies that increase demand will just be capitalised into the prices. So... Um, Doug McTaggart. So can I just add, oh, I mean, I, sorry. I do understand the difficulty of young people getting into the housing market and one of the things that concerns me is that the high housing prices reinforce the existing distribution of wealth within society because if you come from a wealthy family, your parents, you've got the bank of mum and dad that you may or may not be able to rely on, so that's fine for those children, kids who come from those families. But if you don't come from such a family, it's much, much harder to get into the housing market than it, than it once was. And I think that's a social problem. It's not like the Reserve Bank can do anything about it, but I think it's, it's, it's quite a significant issue. Kind of, it affects the kind of mobility within society and reinforces the existing distribution of wealth, which is, can't be a good thing. Sorry. Uh, Governor Doug McTaggart, independent. <laughs> Uh, look, well, great talk, very well balanced and, 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 and terrific, uh, I think, uh, positioning of, of where that market is. Can I ask you a somewhat different question? Um, uh, Tim spoke about the legacy of uh, central banking in Australia. has been terrific and I agree with that. But other, cent other central bankers around the world speak in the rhetoric of generating some inflation. A, do you think that that's what central banks around the world should be doing? And if they are... Do you think they're good enough to get the right level of inflation and have it stop? Or can trying to generate inflation create even bigger problems? The, the, the reason we have kind of... I think the primary reason we have low inflation right around the world at the moment is low wage growth. Now, I think Western workers feel under threat. They're under, they feel under threat through kind of technology or through globalisation. We all, we all feel like there are more competitors out there, either from the robots or from the, the foreigners. And when we feel like there are more competitors, kind of we're less inclined to put our hand up and ask for a bigger wage rise. And I see evidence of this in Australia. You know, wage growth is kind of, seems to be now kind of at 
probably the first central bank governor to have said, well, it'd be good to have a bit more there. But at the, at the moment, kind of we're stuck at 2%. And you see this even you know, in the US, Japan, Germany, the UK, they're all at full employment. But, and wage growth is kind of gradually picking up. But it's only very, very gradually because I think workers feel uh, under threat. So central banks, a number of central banks are trying to run their economy at quite a, a strong pace. And hopefully that will lead to wage growth picking up and inflation rising. That, that would be a, a good outcome. And can that occur without the thing getting out of control? I think it can. Now, if it's some modest lift in wage growth and inflation at the moment, it would be good. I don't, I don't see any reason why workers would go from accepting quite modest wage increases to demanding very, very large wage increases. It could happen, but I don't think it's the central scenario. And if that starts happening, the central banks will tighten up a bit. That's what happened in the late 60s. Yeah, it could. I think that kind of the... Because of, because of the robots and the foreigners, that's how you know, we all feel. Like, and I don't think that's going to change. So we're all going to feel for quite some time that there are more competitors out there. And none of us, you know, competition's good for us, but none of us actually like it. <laughs> it, gives us more, it gives us less pricing power as well. We kind of feel under threat, so we're kind of a bit more kind of subdued. I, I think many firms feel this as well. There are more competitors out there. So the, the system is less inflation prone at the moment. Whether that be the case, I don't know. We've got, you know, as I said, four very big Western countries now at full employment. So we'll get some, you know, fortunately for us, we'll get some kind of examples of kind of how that plays out because we're not at full employment yet. Right now, I, I saw a question right over here in the corner and another one here and here. Uh, so, Kean, sorry, do you? James, McCau James McCauley, Brisbane Grammar School. Uh, how influential is the demand for investment properties in driving up the housing prices? Uh, it's certainly a factor. I think that the, the, the underlying reason is this kind of supply-demand situation. You know, we haven't, population's been going strong, growing strong, and we haven't built enough houses. The transport hasn't been enough. That's, that's the underlying reason. But once prices start going up and interest rates are low, investors think, well, what a great thing to do, go and buy residential property, borrow the money, take some leverage and buy into an asset whose price is rising. And I do think in some markets, not everywhere, that has pushed prices up even more. And so one of the things that the prudential measures are designed to do is to try and take some of that amplification from the investor side out of the market. Whether, whether the measures will be successful in doing that, I think it remains to be seen. But at least analytically, that's what I see we're trying to do, is to try and take some of that amplification from investors out of the market while this better balance between supply and demand is being established. Yeah. I'll have to see how it plays out. Uh, so there's a question right here. Hi, um, yeah, Damien Lillicrap, <laughs> QSUFA. So a question a bit like Doug's about the philosophy of central banking. So you, um, right, so oh, okay, you, you mentioned um, in the talk about limiting credit growth to be largely in line with income growth. That was a philosophy that Volcker used to have and he's a highly esteemed central banker. Greenspan, when he came in, broke that link and let credit growth run well ahead of income growth. From that, um, you had a lot of credit going towards the purchase of existing assets and arguably that sort of led to the tech bubble, the US housing bubble and you know, subsequent sort of corrections there. So, so I guess the... The question is largely, would you agree that you know, Greenspan's relaxed that relationship too much? Well, I, don't, I don't really want to kind of comment on US monetary policy, but the, I, just, I want to make it clear that we're not talking about kind of a limit on credit growth. You know, we don't have a target for that. I think it would be kind of inappropriate to do it. The, the point I was making is if, if the next, in next few years, credit growth and pricing, house price growth were, were no faster than income growth. I think that would be a good outcome. It's not kind of an objective for ours, but that, that's what kind of I think success here would, would, would look like. Um, whether we can achieve that, I, I, don't, I don't know. But um, we, do, we do need to pay attention to the financial side of the economy. I, you know, we've got a flexible inflation target. We've never been a central bank that's kind of saw the kind of the... In the need to keep inflation in the 2 to 3% band all the time. Uh, it's very much about delivering a low average rate of inflation over time. And I, I think by paying attention to the credit side, we can deliver you the low average rate of inflation and produce a greater degree of stability than if we just turned the 
put, put the blinkers on with the credit side. But it's not an objective, it's, it's kind of something we've got in our mind and it, it, it influences the decisions that we take each month. Um, I saw a question right over here. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Dan Ganaway from Horizon. Uh, my question's unrelated to housing, but it's more around the reference to low interest rates. A uh, recent decision by the, um, the ACCC on regulated pricing uh, applied a long-term market expectation of inflation of 2.4% to a 10-year risk-free rate of 2.12%, thus implying a, a negative real long-term interest rate of point, negative 0.28%. So, um, I'm just wondering, well, what methods does the RBA use to estimate long-term inflation expectations and would the RBA's, RBA's own estimate um, produce a negative long-term negative interest rate? Uh, well, I, I, my expectation is that the inflation rate over the long term in Australia will a a average 2 point something and probably close to 2.5. That's what it's done for the last 25 years. So. Um, my I and my board want to kind of deliver that for you. So I think kind of writing in a number that's close to 2.5% for long-term inflation expectations is a very sensible thing to do. You can get estimates from the, the various bond markets. At the moment, they're, they're a bit lower than that. But And we, we also track consumer inflation expectations, but they tend to be fairly short-term. And they're low at the moment because inflation's low. But if you want a, an estimate for long-term inflation expectations, I encourage you to write in 2.5%. That's uh, trying to. We're trying to deliver that for you. That's that's you know that's what we're trying to do. You know you can make your own judgment whether we, we'll do that or not. I don't know, but you know, that's what we're trying to do. Regarding, uh, sorry, Janet Yellen as a follow-up to that question. Janet Yellen last month was talking about the neutral rate, so the um, the rate at which um, monetary policy is not either neither has a foot on the gas or has it off. Um, does the RBA do? An estimate of the neutral rate, and if so, what would that? Do we do an estimate? We we talk a lot about it. I mean, we can come up with various numbers, and really, it's there's not particular science to it. I think we can understand the factors that are at work. Lower productivity growth, if that's the world we're in, will deliver a lower um, real interest rate on average over time. Uh, demographics can have an influence as well, and attitudes to debt have an influence as well. When people were happy to borrow a lot and increase their, their borrowing, they were spending um, with gay abandon and it was kind of, the, the, the economy was growing more, more strongly and you need a higher real interest rate to deal with that. In a world where people want to pay back debt, the real interest rate for a while is lower while they do that. Um, ultimately it comes though down to productivity growth. Can we, if you're a productivity pessimist, do you think we're going to have, we'll have lower real interest rates because the low return on cap, there'll be low return on capital? If you're an optimist, which is what I, I tend to the optimistic perspective that um, we'll, we'll find ways to invest in, in kind of good projects that generate decent returns, and that will allow savers to get decent returns higher than they've got in the last decade. But this is, this is kind of, we talk about this a lot at the central bank. You can imagine with a couple of hundred economists, they kind of like talking about these issues. But in truth, no one can really come up with a kind of a very precise answer to the question. Um, look, I think uh, we may well have run out of time. Um, so look, sorry, that one's one moment. Um, thank you all for your excellent questions. Um, and thanks to the governor for your clear responses. The governor and I are going to return to our seats. Um, and Brian Sheehan, the executive chairman of Morgan's Financial Limited, is going to uh, come up and deliver a vote of thanks. After the vote of thanks, Julian Pierce, the vice president of the Economic Society, will briefly run some of, through some of the society's future events. So, Matt, thank you so very much. Thank you.